According to the Times Higher Education World University Rankings, Oxford University is the highest ranked university in the world, boasting of having produced world leaders in science, industry, politics, art and commerce. Some of the influential names that have passed through the institution include the former American President Bill Clinton, former British Prime Minister David Cameron, American-born media magnate Rupert Murdoch, Lord of the Rings author J.R. Tolkien, former Prime Minister of Pakistan Benzir Bhutto, amongst a rich fabric of others. For most African scholars, passing through this institute is only a fantasy that can only be imagined. Several thousand of kilometers from Oxford, in Africa, in a deep remote part of Zimbabwe, lies a rural place called Gokwe. Gokwe, which is 225 kilometers west of the capital city Harare, is a cotton farming community with a dilapidated road infrastructure, which makes it headline as one of the worst constituencies in Zimbabwe. Coupled to this, it is known as a malaria hot zone, which makes life difficult for the communities. For many Zimbabweans, Gokwe is a place where nothing good can ever come from. On the 1st of November, 1994, at a hospital called Gokwe, a new baby girl is born. Her father, a teacher at a local high school, and her mother, a housewife, welcome their second daughter into their lives and ordain her with the name Petronella Munyaradzi Munenja. It was just another one of the million births that have happened in this remote cotton farming community of Gokwe. Just another of the countless young girls who end up being married before they finish primary school. After all, what good could come out of Gokwe? Unknown to many, this 1st of November, 1994, inside the walls of Gokwe Hospital, a journey was born which would ultimately connect the elite Oxford University and remote Gokwe, two totally different worlds which were never meant to meet. My name is Petronella Munyarad Munenja. Some of my friends call me Petty, some of my friends call me Munya. You can call me either really, I don't mind. I was born in Gokwe on 1 November 1994, which makes me 26 years old. And when I was born, my father was working at a school called Nyamlolo High School. He was a history teacher. And my mom by then was a housewife. She had just completed her all levels and they got married quite early. So in 1994, when I was born, they were staying in Nyamuroro where my dad worked as a teacher. And during this phase of our life, we stayed with my dad siblings. My grandfather passed on quite early in life when my dad was still young and when he passed on he assumed responsibility for everyone in the family. So during this time we stayed almost the 11 of us <laughs> I think. Um, my dad, his brothers, his sister, one of the sisters had gotten married but then we stayed with her child and this was a very interesting almost weird living arrangement really and we stayed there for some time and after a while they realized that it wasn't really sustainable for us to live in those huge numbers in a schoolyard and then they made a decision to move and this was not a move to say oh well, we're going to go to the city or what uh, but then they moved to Goka South. I joined the um, Hillside Chess College to study for my postgraduate diploma in education. So we had to move first the whole family to Blawai. Then after graduation, we came back to Nyamroro Batana High in Gokwe. And I think I taught for a month, and then I was appointed acting head at St. Chambers Secondary School. I was supposed to pioneer that school. And then uh, we, we were there briefly in 1997, and then we shifted to Msadzi Secondary School the same 1997 up to 1998. My dad got a promotion to become a headmaster at Sim Chamber 1 Secondary School and we had to relocate. And by this time, 
it was me and my sister and still with my dad siblings some of them had started going to school some of them st were still around but then essentially we moved to Simjambo and this is an area in Goka South. At the age of four Petronella was forced to start school because her mother who was at the time a grade one temporary teacher could not afford a maid to stay with her. The school which was situated in Gokwe North accommodated close to 2,000 children under the guidance of close to 45 teachers. Her father, an energetic young teacher, worked at the local secondary school. This meant that her mother became her first teacher and this arrangement was the first platform to test her mental acumen. I tell my challenges when addressing me. I'm going to go to the meme, meme, meme. Saka, maybe I think she felt that she was going to go to the meme chat. I think she thinks it's not enough. She was going to go to the meme chat. She was going to go to the meme chat. By the end of the day, she combined the two words. I said, I'm going to go to the meme mama, miss mama. How could such a young girl relate to this mother teacher situation? and the change of language from Shona to Tonga. I think that it's actually an advantage that I was that young because when you're young, you, your mind works faster and you learn easily. Up until now, this was almost 20, 22 years ago, I think, but I can still see some phases. Musimbi, uh, Mulombe. I'm not quite sure of the diction, but I, I picked up some of the words. And back then, I actually got fluent with the language. And because this was the community that we found ourselves in, we had to adapt. And also because most of the people that I learned with, the people that we interacted with in class, at church, were Tonga, we had to adapt. And I spoke the language. I think maybe if I had spoken it frequently over the years, I would have still remembered it. I took church to interpret I interpreted Tonga. To Shona, Shona to Tonga. So I think in the bank back it had advantage Babo. Post attack Sangana and Vish Tonga, Nema Shona, Tispinda Chesi Machete. So I could titor Shona Chete, it was unfair to the Tonga people. Could Kutor Shona, Jerofut unfair to the other side. So at the end of the day, there was an interpreter, I interpret. So I Jacam Batra Petronella, I to Nongama Mawades a Tonga. Whilst she was still in grade one, her father, Mr. Munenda, then got a job with the Better Schools program and transferred to Nembuzia, which was at the other side of Gokwe, called Gokwe North. This meant that she had to leave her mother behind in Simu Chembo to stay with her father, who was now working at a local high school. The new school, a Catholic primary school called St. Joseph's, was acutely different from her first school, Simu Chembo. So, by that time, anger sat up and took control, but so when could crash things like that with Simchembo. But then I was appointed district resource teacher for Better Schools Program Zimbabwe in Nembuzia Gokwe in the year 2000. So we're at Nembuzia Growth Point, and that's when she was um, um, yeah, she was going to St. Joseph's Lunga Primary School. Our community is very poor. Okay. They are peasant farmers, most of them. And the furthest place is about 10 to 15 kilometers. So our people are footing from as far as 15, 10 to 15 kilometers to school daily. So it, 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 it impedes much on the girl child negatively. It affects the girl child. Look at the situation whereby the child has to foot from home to school. She foots for about 10 to 15 kilometers. When she comes here, she will be exhausted, especially when looking at the girl child. And when she goes back, even if the teachers give her some homework, she won't be able to attend to that. So it has some negative effects on the girl child, especially when it comes to the learning situation. At the start of grade two, her father was promoted to head at Tsungai Secondary School, which was further north. This was a positive development for Mr. Menendez's career. It was, however, a different story for Petronella. Before the young girl could settle at Tsungai Primary, 
Mr. Munenzo was again transferred to a school in Gokwe North, in an area called Gumunyu, which is northwest of Tsungai, to a school known as St. Kizito. She was to readjust again to the new and different conditions that came with the new school. Gumunyu is particularly interesting for me because when we got there, I was in grade three and then I got to a school that was being built. So there is a system that people do when they are building schools whereby they, they progress each year. So they start with grade ones, the next year they make those grade ones, grade twos, grade threes, grade fours, grade five, grade six, and then they just create that progression. So when I got there, the school ended at grade three. So that eventually made us seniors at the school. And <laughs> it's quite interesting. And, and, and my sister, she, because she was in grade six, she couldn't come with me to San Kizito, which is the name of the school. She had to learn at a school called Nyamasaka, which was six kilometers away. So she essentially had to walk about 12 kilometers every day to and from school. And I had to learn at San Kizito, which essentially made me a senior. <laughs> in grade four petronella was transferred again this time to another province in matabeleland south in guanda which was dominantly debele speaking province the heavens were smiling down on dad's career as he had been offered a lectureship position at Joshua Nkomo Polytechnic. But how did these movements weigh on the young Petronella? In, in a space of a year, I shifted from Nebzia government to Joshua Nkabu Nkomo Polytechnic to lecture there we, as a national and strategic studies lecture. Then there was a lot of movement. She went to Chegutu to stay with my mother. I was in uh, Gwanda with the mother and the other daughter, the first child patients, and she was alone. At a certain time, it affected me. I remember one other time, but the uh, uh, performance was low. After a short while, she was to move to Chegutu to stay with her aunt. Although her father welcomed the career opportunities that were coming his way, as it meant a better income for the family. This was the first time she was not staying with either of her parents. It's very interesting because we have this thing where we say that consistency ultimately leads to success and then we sort of like dismiss other experiences that are not so linear and it's quite special to me because those transitions that I'm making, they're not as easy as I'm making them sound because it's hard being a child in your formative years, moving to different schools, trying to make friends each time, trying to learn how, how to communicate to people, moving from a Tonga community to a Shona speaking community, trying to make new friends. You, we, at one time you're wearing a blue uniform and then you move to a school where you have to wear a green uniform and you move to another one where you have to wear a maroon uniform. And the, trans and the transitions are not easy at that age. You are young, you are impressionable. You are trying to make meaning of it. You are, trying, you are learning to read, you are learning to write. And you, you pass the hands through hands of so many teachers. Teachers, we have different expectations. Teachers, we expect you to write differently. We expect you to spell differently, to read differently. And you are at that age and you're trying to figure it all out. So sometimes when I, I, I talk about it, it seems interesting, it seems adventurous. It was 
I'm not taking anything away from it. But it was also not that easy. It was also not easy trying to acclimatize at each stage in your life, at every turn, at every point, at every year. Make new friends, forget them, move on. It was hard. A year later, Petronella was on the road again, this time to a familiar place. Mr. Munenda was transferred back to Nembudzia to head the local high school. She was to be reunited with her grade two colleagues at St. Joseph's Primary School, where she was to finish her primary education. Mr. Munenda's career continued to soar as he was to be made CEO of Gokwe North Rural District Council. This was the time that her mother got a place at Mukoba Teachers College in Gweru to train to be a professional teacher. Incredibly, that was also the same year she was blessed with her third child, Pamela. That was one of the, my most difficult times in life. It was to me really, it pained me, <clears throat> but I had no choice. I had to go to the college and be trained as a qualified teacher. At the same time, it, it, it was now going to be difficult for me to come every weekend because uh, I was at, at Mkoba teachers. So it was maybe once a month to visit them. An estimated 60% of young girls get married before they finish their primary school in Gokwe, which makes it a fit to finish primary school. After finishing her primary school, she was enrolled at Rio Tinto for her secondary education which came with a gruesome journey through the rugged Gokwe roads. Boarding school came with its own challenges for the young girl, which further molded her character. Being at a boarding setup, meeting people from Harare, from Lawayo, from Gweru, meeting these people with these interesting stories to tell, people with, uh, and then you, no matter how, how good you have it at home, you lack a particular exposure and it, it's sort of like if you're not careful it will it will hold you back i remember one distinct incident that stuck with me that could have broken me uh i i walked into this group of girls you know they were sitting in the hostel and they were talking about one time um about the experiences that they had at the agricultural show in Arari, and having grown up in Gwakwe, having uh seen my dad practice farming, having seen people practice cotton farming, having seen a lot of farming communities. The moment I had agricultural show, what clicked in my head was it was sort of some um, maybe an expose of farmers of sorts. That's what I thought. Why was I wrong? And I remember just running, running in and then just jumping into the conversation and being like, okay, one time the farmer did this and they all looked at me like, go, what are you talking about? And and they laughed at me because it's their version of an agricultural show was a week of, which I got to know in 2014 when I started staying in Ireland, by the way, uh, was their version of the agricultural show was uh, going to the uh, Rari Shore grounds, uh, having cotton candy, having chocolate dipped apples, uh, horse riding. My version of it was farmers literally farming. And I remember they laughed at me. I remember looking down. I wanted to cry, you know, it's, it's hard. I didn't have any cool, interesting stories to tell. Life was to take a downturn that was to test the family's character when she was in Form 4. Her father lost his job as CEO of Gokwe North Rural District Council. This meant a sudden change in the family lifestyle and income. Not to be outdone by the sudden change in fortune, the family rallied behind their father and embraced their demise. At this point in time, Petronella made up her mind to be a lawyer. But when her O-level results came, she had failed Shona, her native language. One prerequisite to study law is for one to have at least two languages at O-level. This meant she had to rewrite the subject to meet this requirement. Sometimes I wanted to be a lawyer, sometimes I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, Sometimes I just wanted to finish school. So um, I didn't know really what I wanted to be, but I knew that I had this passion for what I've grown to know that they are called social sciences now. But then by then I just had a passion for literature. I had a passion for history. I had a passion for, for all things that enabled me to express myself, to, to, to 
argue to put my thoughts forward to just say what i think explain things in my own way in my own worldview i like that and so it sort of like contrasted me and my sister who was a very numbers person she was known for being a maths genius she was known for being a chemistry genius and i just chose not to like that and i remember one time when i was choosing my combination my mom was actually worried about me because she she recommended that i i either do sciences or commercials like my sister had done and it was really took some work convincing them during those days in indian would that is not a specific could you must do this as my slogan was you must do well you must excel uh, life is what you make if you want a good life you have to work for it you have to make it now that was my slogan after finishing a level petronella applied to the university of Joburg and the university of kozulu natal in south africa unknown to her she was to enter into a period of depression uh, so my dad had lost his job. He was no longer the CEO. We no longer had those cars, those houses. We now he was now a headmaster again. He was back to the Minister of Education. So I remember asking my parents if I could go and apply law to South Africa, hoping that I get a scholarship. And I went to South Africa March of 2013. I'm not really sure about the month, but around, around about that time. I went and applied for law at the University of Johannesburg and a few weeks later they called me and they told me that I could not they, I could not go through the HACE process without an A-level certificate and back then Zimsec took two years to give you your certificate so if you wrote in 2012 you would get your certificate in 2014. I couldn't get the certificate I couldn't get in and it was also too late for me to apply to use it. So this becomes a very dark period of my life. It becomes a period of my life where if a person asked me, what do you want to be in life? I didn't have a question for them. I didn't know what I was going to do the next day. I didn't know what was going to happen. And most of my friends um, from from Rio Tino, from Chesia, are at university. They are talking about assignments. I don't even know what that means. They're talking about lectures. They're talking about semesters. And I had no idea what they meant. And so during this time, temporary teachers were quite common in Guapo. A lot of students who finished A-level went to teach. And I taught the whole of 2013 and 2014. I taught. And at some point in my life, I felt like this was all I was ever going to become. At some point in my life, I genuinely could not see the way forward. I, I couldn't. Um, and I remember one time, it stands out for me. I almost took my life. I don't like talking about it. I'm not proud of it. I regret it. But I also feel like if I'm, if I'm going to be completely honest in telling my story, I have to be honest with all parts of me, the pretty, the scary, the ugly, and everything that makes me me. Things got really bad. I remember my mom had gotten her driver's license and my sister was at university. She was studying to be a physiotherapist. And literally everything in my life made sense except my life. Everyone that I knew was progressing except me. My friends were progressing. I wasn't. I thought of getting married. I thought of teaching full time. And one day it got so bad, I almost took my life. Uh, it was an empty void. I, I, you, when I was walking, you could tell that uh, something was eating me up. I had no idea what I was going to be, what I was going to do. And my parents, being quite strict and disciplinarians, they expected more from me. And waking up each day knowing that I'm disappointing them, knowing that I'm not the child that they expect me to be hurt me. They never verbalized it. They never said it to my face. But I could tell. I could see a disapproving look in their eyes. I could tell 
they wanted more for me and they couldn't get it and it becomes a very dark phase of my life it becomes a very sad phase of my life where i could not see a way forward where i could not know for for in the name of god who i wanted to be and i think it's part of the reason why i'm sympathetic at people and why i'm very encouraging and comforting to people when they don't see a way forward because life has taught me that no matter how dark it gets it always gets better gokwe is quite remote and during that time many trained teachers did not really like teaching in the furthest parts so there were always vacancies open waiting to be filled by a level students waiting to go to university to escape the depression that came with not going to university Petronella was to teach at Chinyenyetu primary school which was between Sanyati and Nembudzia. These years also saw her teaching in some of her former schools, namely Nembudzia High and St Joseph's Primary School. Finally, in 2014, after what seemed like a long wait, the young woman enrolled for a Bachelor of Arts at the University of Zimbabwe. However, this degree was considered as one of the awkward degrees on campus. which did not lead to lucrative career opportunities. Although many people looked down upon this degree, there was no option for the young girl but to persevere and hope to get something better later. I thought okay, I could do it. It's a degree after all. How, how bad can it be? Uh <laughs> it was really bad. And then I came back for school, but then when we came to our it was already August and schools were already had already opened. meaning that i came to school 3 weeks after opening and it seems to be a, a motif in my life struggling to fit in you know i'm behind people have already started their classes and i had been offered a uh, war in uh, no i had been offered economic history english and theater arts and i remember one someone laughing at me and saying ah people who do theater arts they're just going they act you know they come to 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 functions that people are having they act barking like dogs on stage I remember saying you know what i'm not going to bark i'm not going to do that i'm going to do something else and i took an option called war in strategic studies life was good and only a few weeks uh, so a few weeks of my starting school i was staying with my mom's sister in mount pleasant heights and one time when i was coming from school i was attacked by by in in i i didn't i couldn't tell his face he was wearing a, a huge, huge black puffy jacket and after that incident my parents figured you know what if i was going to be safe i would have to move into college accommodation and it was after i moved into college accommodation that i realized that okay my degree is bad not bad in 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 itself but bad in how it was perceived by people and it actually made sense to me why one time when I was just staying with my my mom's sister one preacher got up and said you actually see people celebrating saying that their child has passed when she has done a bachelor of arts degree i i didn't understand the stereotype behind that statement until i got to stay and use that and i realized that people called it being around that is supposed to be bachelor of arts but people termed the abbreviation being around it was associated with loitering it was associated with walking about aimlessly it was associated with um uh, being a hub for the pretty dumb girls yeah i'm putting it bluntly you know um it was associated with all those things and when i would go back home for vacation and people would ask me what are you studying and when i said ba they would be like oh so you're going to be a teacher then you know it it was this common stereotype and then i remember being so sad okay i was stuck at home i didn't know what to do and i'm at this point i'm doing this degree that everyone seems to hate what is going to become of me who am i even going to be in this world and second year fast forward second year so what happened was you did ba for your first year and when you transition to your second year different departments selected students that they gave an honors to and i was given an honors in in economic history um it was a long way from law which is what i originally wanted to do but it was interesting i loved it it was engaging it was 
I, I came to enjoy it and I was arguably a good student so I did my honors and in 2017 I graduated with honors from the Department of Economic History University of Zimbabwe. Outside of class I'd say she seemed uh, disconnected at times. She was closed off and she had her guard up that she was very quiet. She was always by herself. I could see it by herself. But then when we got in class, she was very active in class. Very active, yes. Uh, when she was here, uh, she performed very well. Uh, actually outstanding, uh, both in uh, undergrad as well as in masters. So as, as, as a young girl, we felt, you know, as a department, uh, that uh, Petronella uh, is somebody uh, who works very hard, somebody who strives towards excellence, somebody uh, who do, do assignments, you know, tasks, uh, and a written examination, you know, uh, across many, many uh, courses, uh, then uh, impressed us as a department. Uh, so uh, briefly, I would say that she is such a person uh, whom you might not even imagine that at one point or the other she grew up in you know, a rural environment. But she came here at the University of Zimbabwe, competed with boys, you know, with other ladies, and then scored a first uh, in, 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 um, in, in, in her studies. Petty, uh, she wasn't really a hard worker at first, <laughs> especially when we were in high school. Um, uh, but what I can say is, uh, when she was at when she was at un when when she was at use it, she was a hard worker. Um, she didn't allow the program that she was given at the university to limit her. She just told herself that she was going to pursue it with everything that she had. So she excelled in all her studies, and from that point in her life, she had uh, bigger dreams. After finishing her final year honors, Petronella received a call from the department offering her a teaching assistant position in accordance with the university's graduate teaching program. This is a program through which the university promotes graduate studies through recruiting teaching assistants, pay 80% of the entire tuition, while also offering them a monthly stipend. Her results show that out of 24 courses that contributed to the degree class, she had gotten 16 distinctions. The teaching assistant program and its benefits allowed her to pursue her master's with little assistance from her parents. And after I graduated with honors, I was offered a place for a master's under a graduate teaching assistant program where you could teach other students part-time some uh, as a tutor and also take your classes, meaning that the university would foot part of your fees and would also get a stipend on the side, which was an amazing opportunity and a big breather for my parents. Um, and I did that. Uh, so I did my master's from 2017 August and I finished it in 27, 2018 December. I had good grades. Uh, and the big question now was what's next? Uh, and, and you know how it is. People are applying for PhDs. People are applying for this. And I remember one time when we were sitting in, in the office that we shared with other GTAs, I remember saying, I'm going to go to Oxford. And people laughed. They're like, ha. Huh? names would come on Oxford people don't go to Oxford and and I remember thinking to myself girl with the path that you've walked everything that you've been through being here in itself is a miracle being this person itself is a miracle surely you can be anything that you want to be even if you don't get it what hurts in applying just go for it and I was with one of my friends and I actually wrote an email out to my, super, to my potential supervisor and I remember telling her exactly how to do it and she said she was going to do it and she never got around to do it. She panicked and I don't blame her because I think sometimes when you grow up in a particular way, when you grow up with lack, without access, it's hard to position yourself in environments where you can actually do it because you're not programmed to believe that you deserve it. And which is why my biggest message to people is the first step to being successful is believing that you deserve it.
looking at yourself and saying despite all that I've been through despite all that has happened to me I deserve to be happy I deserve to do it I deserve access I deserve favor I deserve recognition I deserve to be happy I deserve it and I chose to deserve it nothing in my background seemed so but I did it was at this stage that her life started coming together. She was to travel to Italy for a conference at the University of Bologna. Her first published paper had been accepted for the conference that was being hosted there. Her vision was becoming clearer now, as she was to travel to Los Angeles later, representing the organization for the YSI Africa Working Group. Now I remember the day when she told me that her paper got, when she was going to Italy, I remember we were so happy and I remember telling her, I was telling her like, us we are privileged, like when we go out of this country, we are just visiting our neighboring African countries. So for her, I was telling her, see your first time of going out of Zimbabwe and then you have a visa, you're going to Europe. So yeah, we were very happy. In 2018, her department at the University of Zimbabwe hosted an Africa Oxford Initiative Workshop. It was a workshop aimed at promoting interaction between African scholars on the continent and those at Oxford, together with students sharing their experiences at Oxford and the process of applying to Oxford. Later that night, she was to tell her family she wanted to go to Oxford. The girl from Gokwe had set her eyes on an unimaginable feat. I remember one time, my, I saw that I had an emo icon on my phone. And I opened it. I didn't even know what was going to be. And I saw an email saying that, Miss Petronella Mnyarad Munyenza, we, we have offered you a place in Oxford. <laughs> I had applied for two programs. And I got both of them. In that moment, I cried. I, I, I didn't know how else. I didn't know how else to react. I looked back at my life. I saw the girl in Simuchembo. I saw the girl in Songai. I saw the girl in Chonda, in Pupajena, in Gumuny, in St. Joseph, in Nembuzia, in Rio Tindo, in Chesia. And never in my life had I seen myself being that girl. And there was that letter telling me that I had gotten into Oxford. My dream in a word. I was so shocked. I could not believe it. I just I remember that that afternoon. I just it was me, Petty, and her sister. I just told them, girls, let's stand up and praise God. This is the grace of God. Mm. Mm. Uh, I was so shocked. I was I was any relatives in Oxford. I don't know, this is the grace of God. Mm. I remember that I was this. Mm. Uh, I don't know, I don't Some would say I'm on cloud nine. Some would say I'm elated. Some would say I feel so blessed and that God has smiled on me and his face is on us because we would not really attribute it to your intelligence or what, but it, it, I, I feel uh, it's, it's, it's just the blessing of the Lord. So uh, as a father, I'm so happy for her, but there's something that is inside me which still feels that she, she, she's got a lot of territories to conquer ahead of her. The zeal in here, the, 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 the push and the drive. I want to believe uh, there are many, 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 many territories to conquer, yes. Ah, I was excited. I think everyone is, was excited because um, Petty is one person who is passionate about family. She's passionate about everyone else. So we knew that if Petty is going to Oxford, uh, it's an opportunity for every one of us, even my children, and even uh, my, other young, my, my other younger sisters. So we were all excited. 
like my younger sister who, is, who has just returned form six. Uh, she, she now also has an, a, a dream of going to the university, to Oxford University because of Pitt. So everyone is excited because she's setting a good example. And financially, she supports everyone. So I'm so happy for her. <laughs> I'm so happy. I never imagined she would go to Oxford, but I knew she could go far because she was intelligent. You know, there are times that you see someone and then you really know, even if you want to be jealous, you cannot be because there is results to show, there are results to show. You can see that this person is brilliant. And yeah, so when she told me that she got in, in Oxford, I was very happy for her and I knew it would happen, but I just didn't know she would go to Oxford. In terms of students in uh, the Department of Economic History generally, uh, the model that we have had uh, has been um, uh, external oriented. Our students have been uh, trained to for for the for the for the international universities, international institutions. So, so we we just saw it as one among many with the potential to join the many economic historians that are in the. Uh, in, uh, that have become part of the international community. And given uh, the kind of uh, zeal, effort, and, uh, and passion, and uh, level of uh, academic performance, uh, we, 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 I personally would not have been surprised, really, because I think by the time she was already at Masters, she had set up her mind to, you know, to shine. And so in terms of the effort she was putting, in terms of the uh, commitment she was putting, it was clear that uh, she was aiming for the, uh, uh, probably not even the, the, uh, the, the sky, for the stars. And, 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 and so uh, I, I saw it coming, if you want, uh, somehow, uh, because of the kind of performance and the kind of orientation that the department also gave to students. So there are many others before here that uh, have gone specifically to Oxford. Uh, I might not say many, but there are quite a number. Uh, but uh, many that have gone to, to the States. Um, and then now recently uh, Stellenbosch. So she was part of a cohort of you know, students with, con with confidence in, in terms of uh, her potential and capacity. I remember when I told my dad, no one could believe that. It, it was huge, it was beautiful, it was amazing. It, it was, and right at the moment, it became clear to me that you can be anything you want to be in this world. And after that, I got another lecture that told me that I had gotten a scholarship and that I could come to Oxford. And in September 2019, I left my country to go to Oxford. And the story gets interesting after that. The moment I got into this, into this place of access, the moment I got into this place of my dreams, it became clear to me that maybe I don't really belong, especially when one girl asked me, so where do you come from in Zimbabwe? Are you from Marare? Because where I come from, people from the country don't go to college and I thought to myself oh wow oh wow what does it mean for you to deserve success what does it mean for you to be said for that and I remember looking at her and saying where I come from you can't even find it on the map I come from Guagua she didn't know how to make of it and and I constantly got questions how did you come here how did you make it from Africa to Oxford and it became clear to me that there are ceilings that are placed on success and I decided to tell my story to encourage you to tell your story and everyone everywhere that you know what it's, it's, it doesn't matter where you start it, it doesn't even matter where you begin it doesn't even matter where your parents are it doesn't even matter where you stay wherever you decide to be by the grace of God and hard work you can be and that is my story Many young girls in Gokwe do not realize their dreams because of the boundaries that the society places around them. Most get pregnant before they even finish primary school and fade away into child marriages. 
many are consumed by the cotton growing industry and wait for the natural process that will lead them to the grave. There is no escape from the circle of girl life in Gokwe. No inspiration, no hope. Girls do not see the best in themselves. Yet Petronella saw the best in herself and fought to show it to the world. Now she sets her eyes on inspiring the girls back in Gokwe to show them that they too can achieve anything. Going back to all the schools she went to evoked something within her. She has now written a book about her journey from Gokwe to Oxford to inspire the thousands of young girls so that they too can see the best in themselves and break the chains that bound their progress. From Gokwe to Oxford tells the story in depth and captures all the emotions that come with the journey. It is a personalized narrative from Petronella herself, the girl who dared to dream.